I'm going to begin today by telling you that I have an audio-only bonus on some news out of the Vatican that is just way too spicy for this place. Check the pinned comment for a link to an audio-only embedded player for this bonus show, or find Return to Tradition on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or any of the other major podcasting platforms. The patrons of this channel really make it possible for me to give you these extra things as they happen, even if I have to put them off-platform. You don't want to miss it. It does involve the meeting of the Pacamama issue, the Moloch servants, and Francis's desire to build a world in the image and likeness of the Laudato Si message, all in keeping with the powers of Caesar, and it's all bundled up together. That audio-only episode is 100% unfiltered. Again, the pinned comment is where you'll find a link to that episode. Now on to the more regular topic of the day. The mind of the modernist is something hard to fathom at times. For them, figures like you and I, who most certainly hold views outside the mainstream of the Catholic world in our time, are bad enough, but mostly ignored. While men who are much more in keeping with the average faithful diocesan pre parish priest in parish in middle America are called into question. America Magazine went after a retired bishop cut from the mold of Benedict XVI, and they called him a schismatic, as well as calling a pretty normal Catholic outlet schismatic as well. Let's take a look at this, because this is a ridiculous story on its face, but it gives us insight into something else that's going on that I'm going to touch on towards the end. Our story comes from, where else, the National Catholic Reporter and America Magazine, two outlets attached at the hip that are known for promoting a view of the faith that would have been considered a parody of the faith if it were presented by Monty Python, but is instead sadly something many people think is the actual faith. Archbishop Chapu came out and told the truth about EWTN, that they are not schismatic in the slightest, and got the business end of National Catholic Reporter and America Magazine's wrath for his troubles. Let's take a look at the piece in question, because it's a whopper. Quote, Last Thursday was a good day for Archbishop Charles Chaput, the former Archbishop of Philadelphia. He got to call Pope Francis a liar in the pages of First Things. Chaput was ostensibly responding to an article published in America Magazine, in which Austin Ivere discussed Pope Francis's comments about EWTN, the non-Bergolian Catholic media outlet. And Chaput acknowledged the linkage. To be fair, Ivere's article simply elaborates on comments that Pope Francis made recently to Jesuits in Slovakia, he writes. Pope Francis didn't name the offending media organization, but as journalists quickly confirmed, he meant EWTN. When he goes on to explain that EWTN is not nearly as fearsome as, say, Facebook, he is aware of its strengths and its weaknesses. He is wrestling with Ivere, but then he gets to the central contention of his article. Any suggestion that EWTN is unfaithful to the Church, the Second Vatican Council, or the Holy See is simply vindictive and false. End quote. Notice that America Magazine, by extension Francis, are conflating the presumed pontiff as himself with the Church. Virtually anyone who is awake to the state of the Church admits to themselves that Francis is almost certainly going to be the subject of a future council, or at least actions taken by a future pontiff, that will almost certainly declare his acts to be null and void in one manner or another. That is practically a given at this point, and organizations like America Magazine have the sole job of selling Francis' actions to the public and by extension, so does the National Catholic Reporter. Remember, America Magazine's editor is Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church, who happens to have an important communications consultancy job with the Vatican. I will say this much in Martin's defense, though. They obviously didn't ask his opinion on the synod documents and visual marketing materials because those were clearly outsourced to a daycare center somewhere nearby the Vatican. It's sort of amusing to see people demanding loyalty to the Second Vatican Council, though. I'm going to remind everyone of something Paul VI said at the close of the Council itself, that it's non-binding on the conscience of the faithful. Quoting Paul VI, There are those who ask what authority, what theological qualification the Council intended to give to its teachings, knowing that avoided issuing solemn dogmatic definitions engaging the infallibility of the ecclesiastical magisterium. The answer is known by whoever remembers the conciliar declaration of March 6, 1964, repeated on November 16, 1964. Given the Council's pastoral character, it is avoided pronouncing in an extraordinary manner dogmas endowed with the note of infallibility. End quote. And it's why you see a lot of traditional Catholics, a lot of the hardline ones, who will half jokingly say, I affirm and reaffirm all the infallible teachings of Vatican II. There's a reason for that. Now, however, there do remain debates about how binding a non-binding pastoral council is on the faithful, a step, especially when it is the only council in the history of the church of its kind. But that's not really the point that I'm trying to make here. 
The authors of America Magazine and National Catholic Reporter, like the powers that be in the church, have made a non-binding council binding on the faithful. It's really quite remarkable to watch, especially since you're about to see the authors here take staunch defenders of the now dead hermeneutic of continuity in the council itself and align them as virtual schismatics. Archbishop Chapu is a son of the council. He has long defended Vatican II before. But here they go. Quote, Being unfaithful to the church is exactly what Pope Francis said EWTN was. There is, for example, a large Catholic television channel that has no hesitation in continuing speaking ill of the Pope, Francis said in the third person referring to himself, to the Jesuits in Slovakia. I personally deserve attacks and insults because I am a sinner, but the church does not deserve them. They are the work of the devil. I've also said this to some of them. Archbishop Chaput now states that such a claim is simply vindictive and false. End quote. I have to tread carefully here because the author then attacks EWTN for not being aligned with an American party of Moloch because on social topics, that party has positions on some things that don't conflict with the faith either way. While the author utterly ignores the Moloch topic in its entirety, it's really remarkable, but again, it's all just more of that seamless garment nonsense. The author is conflating essentially that party with the church's official stance on things, which is remarkably disingenuous. The Catholic position on things does not ally with any secular program, full stop. People have a hard time accepting this, but again, the lukewarm will do what the lukewarm will do to justify themselves. But then the author continues, quote, Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, and the two synods that led up to it were a source of constant criticism at EWTN. Indeed, the only Cardinals Raymond Arroyo routinely books are those like Cardinal Raymond Burke and Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, who led the opposition to Amoris Laetitia. In fact, Mueller appeared on EWTN last week, saying the consultation before the synod is unnecessary. The list goes on. Their continued effort to claim the mantle of orthodoxy for themselves while casting aspersion on the Pope's orthodoxy is at least quasi-schismatic. From the Laudato Si topic, to the traditional Latin Mass, to the appointment of American Cardinals to Synodality, EWTN's twin news programs, News Nightly and Arroyo's Weekly the World Over, have been conspicuous in highlighting the Pope's critics and never his defenders. Even non-Bergolian prelates like Cardinal Sean O'Malley do not make the cut for Arroyo anymore because... Imagine that. O'Malley takes his vow of obedience to the Pope seriously. End quote. All right, now for the record, O'Malley is actually an out and out modernist, and that's probably why Arroyo doesn't invite him on, but who really knows at this point? But there it is EWTN, a bastion of frankly middle of the road, normie friendly Novus Ordo Catholicism, are quasi schismatic at the very least, according to the logic of this outlet. Do you see how this works? If you're not on board with Francis's efforts to finish the construction of the ape of the church, you're schismatic, just to be clear. Now, if you'd like to read that article for yourself, I have a link to it in today's show notes at returntotradition.org. That's the name of this podcast with a .org at the end. Skip past the Patreon pop-up since there is no paywall for my sources. Now, why are they acting so irrationally towards a frankly middle-of-the-road Novus Ordo hermeneutic of continuity bishop like Chapu? The man is no Archbishop Lefebvre or even Bishop Athanasius. He had the courage to tell the truth about Amoris Laetitia, a document that is by itself clearly heretical in its application to the nuptial sacrament. Why are they lashing out at him? Hilary White, White, writing over at 1 Peter 5 on the targeting of the Carmelites, offers insight into this that tells us quite a lot and is directly applicable to this. Quote, in our times, these ancient political games are being played again by a Vatican that is holy and manifestly corrupt in every imaginable way. This time, the currency is not land or the wool trade or the early monastics, nor the lucrative servant and commodities trade from the early South American settlements. Now the coin is ideology. The new paradigm of the church is being aggressively forced onto the institution by a group of the most morally, ideologically, theologically, fleshly and financially corrupt men the church has ever had to endure in centuries. It is not going too far to call the Bergolian Vatican a seculum obscurum. We hardly need to go through the list. For a while I was cataloging the cases, starting most famously with the Franciscan friars and sisters of the Immaculate, nuked by visitors, most likely at the request of the Italian Episcopate, who notoriously loathed them for their success, their vigorous growth and their obvious rejection of the Vatican II new paradigm. Since then, there have been perhaps a dozen odd communities of priests and sisters in various countries who have had the visitator hammer fall. The things they all have in common, a love of traditional styles of religious life and liturgy, plus money or property. Why the Fairfield Carmel? 
obviously because they are successful, but most especially because they are successful as traditionalists. They have grown and prospered and are building their beautiful stone monastery. They are popular and have immense support from the laity. All this while very firmly rejecting the modernist quote-unquote reforms of religious life and liturgy that in Rome are considered the litmus test for the acceptance by the contemporary church. End quote. She nails it. Absolutely, unequivocally nails it. But Miss White's point is correct. These ancient secular games are being waged now on every front in the church at this moment, and the figures waging it dare to suggest that not only are we the schismatics, but people who are, frankly, much more mainstream than you and or, or I. Worse, they suggest that very, very mainstream figures like Arroyo and Archbishop Chaput are schismatics when they represent something much more akin to normal Catholics trying to live the faith as best they can with the tools the institutional church makes easily available in our time. That's a Herculean task. There's nothing radical about Arroyo or Chapu at all, and they're the ones called schismatics. Just remember, the charge comes from the outlets that not only speaks for Francis in the English-speaking world, but also run are run by the man who is building a bridge to making the church accept sins that cry out to heaven, and has publicly said he thinks the biblical account of those sins is wrong, meaning he has publicly denied the inerrancy of sacred scripture, which makes him a formal, manifest, public heretic. At the core of this is, of course, Caesar and his dirty silver coins, but also another kind of conflict. I want to expand here on what Miss White was saying in her piece from 1 Peter 5, with this from something else from 1 Peter 5 from some time ago, written by Professor Peter Kwasniewski. And it's this kind of conflict. The traditional Catholic view of the faith is a surrender of ourselves to something exterior, namely to the reign of Christ the King and his church. And the battle here is that of the modernists. Their view is summed up clearly here by Professor Peter Kwasniewski in his description of Pius X's battle against the predecessors of the Martins and Bergoglios of his day. Quote, Consider the modernist reinterpretation of Christianity as the encyclical Pascendi portrays it. For the modernist, faith is an interior sense originating in a need for the divine. It is not a gift from without, but an imminent surge, an intuition of the heart, a subjective experience. Religion, accordingly, is when this sense rises to the level of consciousness and becomes an expression of a worldview. What, then, is revelation? The awakening conscience of the divine within me. Doctrine, in turn, is the intellect's ongoing elaboration of that awakening. While dogmatic formulas are mere symbols or instruments by which the intellect tries to capture the meaning of religious experience. Hence, of necessity, dogma evolves in response to the pressure of vital forces, with ever-changing beliefs corresponding to ever-changing understandings of reality and of subjective experience. What becomes of scripture and tradition? Tradition is the sharing with others of an original experience in such a way that it becomes the experience of others, too, while scripture is the written record of particularly powerful experiences expressed with poetic inspiration. I'm going to interject here for a second. Remember, this is the view of the modernists, and this has been categorically rejected by the church. Until Vatican II, anyway. Continuing. Sacraments are the... Finally, are public gestures by which the assembled faith community represents to itself a certain worldview and excites in itself an awareness of the divine. No wonder the 1907 document Lamentabili Sane from the Holy Office condemned the following modernist proposition, with many others akin to it. Truth is no more unchangeable than man itself, since it involves with him, in him, and through him. As Cardinal Mercier wrote in the same year, Modernism consists essentially in affirming that the religious soul must draw from itself, from nothing but itself, the object and motive of its faith. It rejects all revelation imposed upon the conscience, and thus, as a necessary consequence, becomes the negation of the doctrinal authority of the Church established by Jesus Christ, and it denies, moreover, to the divinely constituted hierarchy the right to govern Christian society. End quote. I hope you found that useful today. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. It really does help. Please keep all the figures I've mentioned here in your prayers, Cardinal Chapu, all of them. And as always, pray for the Church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.